Welcome to our special program on one of the most exciting and talked about business stories of the week, Prudential. I'm Francine Lacqua, and what a week it has been for the British insurer. Well, last weekend, the Prue tried to renegotiate the price for AIG's Asian unit, a deal it saw as vital for the company's future. Now, it would have catapulted Prudential ahead of its rivals, putting it in first place in Asia, the fastest growing region in the world. While the $33.5 billion takeover of AIG would have been the biggest this year. However, Pru was forced to pull out of the deal this week after failing to secure a lower price. Now, the cost of the failed acquisition to the UK insurer is $660 million, almost equivalent to last year's dividend payments. Now, all of this has put the spotlight on Prudential's new CEO, Tijen Tiam, just nine months into the job. And I'm very pleased to say he joins me now, uh, speaking for the first time since the collapse of the deal. Mr. Tiam, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Francine. Do you feel that you're under pressure to resign? Uh, I don't, because I am a servant of the shareholders. If my shareholders wanted me to resign, of course I would. So far, they have not expressed uh, that desire. Uh, what we did here was absolutely the right thing to do. We are a company focused on Asia. Uh, I was listening closely to your introduction. You said, you know, number one in the fastest growing region in the world. It's always been our ambition. And this transaction was a unique opportunity to get ourselves into that position. We worked on it for a long time, really, since September 2008. So that predates, actually, my appointment as CEO, which is an important point. It's not just my brainchild. It's something that was really embraced by the company before. And we really believed that the, the size of the price justified the risk. We carefully assessed through you know, months of analysis, the downsides, the upsides of the transactions, and on balance, we felt that the price was such that it justified the risk. You carefully assessed, and yet you failed to understand that the shareholders would be against this. Do you not feel that they will ask you to resign on Monday? Uh, they have not done so yet. The dialogue with the shareholders uh, doesn't just take place at the AGM. It takes place through daily conversations. Uh, on Tuesday, my chairman and myself were on the phone to our larger shareholders, and we do that regularly. We've done that several times throughout this process. And so far, they have not expressed uh, that position and so have given us clear indications so wrong, to the contrary. Uh, we didn't get it wrong. I think when you say the shareholders didn't agree, well, that never actually happened because we went out with a prospectus on May 17th. By the time we published all the data, markets had already moved very significantly uh, from where they were initially. And about a week into the process, our shareholders who communicate quite freely with us told us, look, market volatility has increased so much that your initial price uh, is not viable in this environment. And we would like you to renegotiate. We had, you know, we're business people, we renegotiate all the time. We had always been trying to get a, a lower price from AIG. And from there, we engaged with AIG. It was very open because they're professionals like us. They know the markets and they're open to the discussion. And the reality, when we said if we failed to agree a, uh, a deal, I wouldn't really agree because we actually did agree a deal with AIG and AIG's management. And we agreed a price which was $30.375 billion, which was a reduction of more than $5 billion compared to the initial price, which the AIG management was happy to take but to Mr. its Tim, board. Again, this is, these are two boards agreeing. I mean, even the first time the two boards agreed and your yes. shareholders yes. were against it. They were not. That has never been established. They were not. The dialogue has been for eight weeks after the announcement of the initial price. We were not able to present our case and give any data because, as you know, the data was simply not available. It only became available mid May. And from there, as I said, we were then presenting the case in a completely different context from the one where the deal had been agreed initially. Uh, there was a little bit of upheaval because mm -hmm. the information was leaked before the prospectus Absolutely. was Absolutely. actually Ready. published. Uh, How much damage did that do to your case? Uh, that was damaging. I mean, of course, we had the leak strategy because you know, we're an organized company. We knew throughout this process. With AIG, we had agreed a number of documents and what would we be, what would we be doing should there be a leak and there was a leak, um, the reality, you know, very, with all humility, we were completely underprepared. The leak happened at a time where we were not prepared to present the case, so we got off to a rocky start uh, from, the, from, from day one. And do you feel responsible because of the leak? I don't know where this leak came from. That may become, uh, you know, unknown someday, but as far as we speak, I have no idea where the leak came from. All we could do is manage the situation as best as we could. And to be honest, the first two days were very bad. And after that, if you look at the share price, 
But then the, three, the next three, four weeks, we got into a first set of investor meetings which went well, and you saw the share price recovering very, very nicely throughout May and April. But then there was again a long period of vacuum. Uh, where speculation was rife and we could not uh, say anything specific. That was certainly, if you think about lessons learned um, in this situation, one is that we were the first transaction in the new world, if I can so speak. A new world for the regulators, new world for investors, new world for the media, new world for companies. And we were kind of a poster child uh, testing all those aspects of uh, the, the new post-financial crisis world for large M&A. So a lot of surprises came from that on all sides. You know, and then we, we uh, the market really, in a transaction like this, there's always one risk you cannot eliminate, is market risk. And that, with, a, with Greece and the Euro, and what we know of the last four to six weeks, played a key role towards the final stage of the process. But do you think you should have process. been more careful, because there was volatility in the markets for the last two to three months. Will you apologize to shareholders mm -hmm. for what's happened in the last three weeks? Uh, sorry, you're asking if I... If you will apologize to shareholders for what's happened, for, for the fiasco that has essentially been this, this possible takeover. Well, it's not a fiasco. I mean, the reality is that by Monday, uh, we agreed a price on, on, uh, on Sunday. By Monday, we had very strong support. One thing that I think the market is missing, and that change between the shareholders and the company, is what Mr. the events Tiam, of last weekend. I have to cut you off. Sure. We're going to a break, and we'll be back in two seconds. Mr. Tian, before the break, you were telling me that actually you don't feel you need to apologize because actually it's in the best interest of Prudential, even what has happened. But you must have regrets of mm. pushing this through the leak, mm. the fact that actually mm. it didn't go through, that mm. you had to renegotiate. Mm. Well, the, the leak, frankly, is not our, it's not of our doing. It's, it's, it's a sad thing that it happened, but it's something that happened and that we, we, we dealt with. The key thing for me, and that is not really well known, are the events of last week and last weekend. What happened by the time we reached an agreement on Sunday is that Monday we were asked to canvass our shareholders and demonstrate to the AIG board that we had significant shareholder support. And that was a fantastic day because really the shareholders rallied around us, loved the agreement that had been reached, were really, really happy Tim, and were very supportive. How many shareholders were supporting you in this? Oh, you, 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 I would say 80% of the top 10 and that's, that's a very large proportion of our, of our register. So you're talking so, you know, immediately 30-40% of the register and the ones we were able to reach uh, on that day. So there was very um, strong comfort that this deal was going to be supported by our shareholder base. And I think part of what's been missed in the analysis of this whole situation and what's not known outside a certain circle is that those events happened and that when this process stopped, the shareholders were actually quite happy with what the company had achieved. And that plays a role in, in the subsequent events. Mr. Jam, uh, talk me through exactly what yeah. happened. On Sunday, yeah. you had an agreement with the board of no, AIG. No, with the management, with, with the, the CEO management. and his team. Uh, for how much? 31 30 billion. 30 billion, million US dollars. And this was always your intention to renegotiate to get a better deal? We, we, we always do, because that's the culture of a company. And quite frankly, um, initially, the process was cut short by the leak and we, we went out, but we, we always, because we always do, we always felt that if we could extract a lower price, we would. A few weeks back, we tried, we tried a number of times as the process was going, but this opportunity came really because it was the market. AIG operates in the same markets we do, knows the reality of the markets and knew that they had to renegotiate because the initial deal was not viable anymore in the new environment. So that conversation was relatively straightforward and we reached an agreement relatively easily. As I said, Monday we, we, we consulted really our largest shareholders. They were very supportive, I would say even enthusiastic. And this went to the AIG board late, late Monday night. So at 30.7, you feel that you would Point have three. had, 30.3, yes. you would have had the backing of all of your shareholders. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, all is, you know, uh, sufficient, sufficient proportion to get it approved. What happened with AIG? Why did they decide not to go uh, ahead with that the will, That's a question you, you may have to ask uh, uh, to people who were in that room and attended the, the AIG board meeting. Let's just say that it was for us uh, an unexpected outcome and a, a big surprise that this offer was rejected. Now, at the end of the day, you have to pay 500, 600 million dollars. Mm for something mm. that actually has mm. bared absolutely no mm. fruits. Do you mm. regret that? I, I'm very sorry that we have to spend that money and didn't get the deal. That is a pity. Uh, it is a lot of money. 
but it is something we honestly carefully considered. Uh, we got a lot of strategic advice, accounting advice, actuarial advice, financing advice throughout this process. We considered the costs and the potential benefits and the board unanimously, the management team felt that it was a risk wor worth taking. Uh, as far as the benefits, um, look, I, I've, we've showed the Q1 numbers, we've showed that uh, March was our best March ever. I receive a lot of emails from our staff in Asia. They are really galvanized um, and they are firing on all cylinders. And I think that uh, as we publish our results going forward, that's something the market will be able to appreciate. The company and is doing extremely well. And even today, after mm. all of that, and mm. we know the outcome, you mm. feel you received good advice from your advisors? Well, at the end of the day, we, we are the ones making the decision. I don't like to blame others. Uh, for things that I've done, uh, the advisors are the advisors, we, we make the decisions, it would be a bit cowardly, frankly, to, to, to blame the advisors today. Now, uh, Mr. Tiam, really the concern, mm. possibly going mm. forward, mm. is can you make any more acquisitions? I mean, mm. how can mm. you explain the fact that the shareholders didn't support mm. this deal? Well, again, I would not uh, concede that they didn't support this deal, because the deal we got to in the end was very strongly, very strongly supported. By, um, by, uh, by our shareholders, which may be actually why this week wasn't as tough as many people thought it may be for, for us, because our shareholders know that in the end we delivered something that was very valuable to them and, and got their enthusiastic support, which was then rejected by AIG, but that's a different discussion. But on Sunday, mm. would you, mm. did you feel that actually even at the higher price it was worth going through? At the moment you're no, I wouldn't basically have, I wouldn't have renegotiated. I wouldn't have renegotiated if I thought that the, the higher price was, was viable. Everybody unanimously, all our shareholders, we the board, the management, considered that there had to be a renegotiation because the markets had made the, the previous price not, 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 not viable. But the reality of our company is that we are doing very well. Okay. We had a fantastic 2009, uh, the numbers, you know, growth of 26% uh, in Q1, that doesn't happen normally in our sector. You know, and the company keeps producing those results, and that is really the platform from which we do everything we are doing. We wouldn't be in such a position if the company wasn't doing that well. But you've been on the front page of every single business newspaper mm. for the last week. Are mm. you concerned that actually your legacy will be to be remembered as the man who failed to get this big acquisition through? Well, I hope, I hope not. Um, you know, the future will tell us. I hope not. I have a very talented team around me. I have a board that's very committed. Uh, this company, I joined this company because uh, it's a great company. It has a fantastic uh, position in Asia, which is a huge opportunity, which is growing very, very, very fast. Uh, we, as CFO, I helped navigate through a crisis of 08 and 09. Uh, Prudential was the best performing insurance company through a crisis. And frankly, as, as an operation, we are in very, very good health. Uh, today, we will publish more results very soon and the market will be able to appreciate how, how well the company is doing. So I hope that some of that will contribute to forming the image that people will keep of me. What will you tell your shareholders on Monday? Hmm. We'll tell them that, um, we'll talk about AA. We'll say, that this, we'll say why we did it. Uh, you know, it's for growth in Asia. Those countries fundamentally are countries that don't really have a welfare state and a lot of what we do there in where the population is the largest in the world is providing economic solution for people to obtain protection for themselves and their family. That proposition is irresistible and has a phenomenal growth potential uh, in Asia. We've always said that we wanted to grow in Asia. This proposition was a way to accelerate that growth. So when people talk about strategy review, that was absolutely in strategy. There was nothing about the AIA acquisition that was not absolutely in our strategy of growing in Asia and growing faster in Asia and being bigger and more profitable in Asia. Now, so we'd explained that. Now, it didn't happen. We, we really believe that it was worth uh, trying, okay? But if one tries, one has to accept that one might not succeed. Uh, so we, 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 in the end, and I explained some of the dynamics, um, the deal didn't happen. It was the right thing to try. It was also the right thing to pull out. Yes, there is a cost, and we are sorry that we had to spend that money without getting the deal done, but we still believe it was the right thing to do. And then we'll talk about some of the, the things the company has been doing, um, the future direction of the company, and how we want uh, to continue implementing this strategy, which has served us so well and has been so successful. Because, frankly, the reason why we were pursuing this deal is our shareholders. We believe 
But had we been successful, this would have served our shareholders well for the years and the decades to come. There is absolutely a huge potential to create value but in this the transaction. the rights issue, Mr. Tiam, was yes. so huge. Mm -hmm. Are you almost not relieved that didn't happen because of volatility we've seen on the markets? Uh, the rights issue, I believe, at the price we had reached at the end of the process would have been successful and the reaction from our shareholders uh, in the indicated that. It is, it is really a pity that the AIG board rejected this offer because I believe it was a very good offer. Do you think there's anything you could have done differently to actually, at the end of the day, have a success story? A comfortable acquisition that you can fund and that would make you grow? It's an important question. I'm sure that, you know, there are many things. It's impossible to act without making mistakes. Uh, very few people have had a chance to conduct a $35 billion transaction in the business world uh, successfully. So I will concede with humility that we've never done it before. Most business, most management teams have never done it before and will never, we'll never do it. And those who do it only do it once. So it's that type of circumstances. And um, I, yes, it is a test of our ability, but relatively limited. I would argue that our key ability is managing an insurance company. And I would argue that we do that very well. We just need to look at our results from that. This experience was absolutely unique. We gave it our best. I am very proud of the work the team did. Yes, there were mistakes, absolutely. Um, I think we, in this new world that I described post-crisis, it was very difficult to estimate how much risk appetite had changed. Do you think you'll come out of the stronger or actually more damaged? Um, as far as Prudential is concerned, I, I, I will quote an email I got today from one of our uh, staff in, in Singapore um, who said that she believes that Prudential comes out of this stronger and taller, is the word she used, than a few months ago. So there is clearly a feeling uh, among our staff in Asia that uh, we tried something very ambitious, but it was the right thing to try to do it. And they are fully behind uh, the ambition and the, and the vision of the company. So going forward, really, uh, we're going to continue doing what we've always believed, which is that there's plenty of growth in Asia. Our key markets are Hong Kong, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines. Kind are of you looking at acquisitions uh, in, in any of these countries to make up for the loss of AIA? My number one objective in all these countries is to hire people who are good at what we do. The biggest constraint to our development, it's a very different situation for most businesses. We're not demand constrained. Our ability to grow is only a function of our ability to find the kind of people we need to go and sell our products successfully. As many people we can hire is as much we will grow. So really, we're going to continue to focus on developing that business model. We have now 110,000 agents in Indonesia, 40,000 in Vietnam, and we continue to develop uh, our, our, our distribution power in the region because that's how we grow uh, very profitably. So that's the ambition. We're going to continue pushing the same strategy in the same markets because it served us very well. Organically, mm. but in terms of acquisitions, mm. I mean, after a 35, mm. you know, a 30.3 billion uh, possibility acquisition, yeah. are you not going to try and go after something you know, smaller? Well, it's 10 billion, almost, uh, it's, it's almost tragic because philosophically, I am not a great fan of acquisitions in terms of business philosophy. I think that they rarely work, but I think that they do sometimes work in certain circumstances when you're putting together companies with uh, a similar strategy, a similar background, a similar culture, a similar operating model. And in the case of AIA, that was uh, absolutely the case, which is why we so enthusiastically promoted the transaction. Now, that being said, uh, the only area where we look at acquisition, and something we've always done, is distribution. You may have heard that we signed a transaction in January with UOB, which was uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand. Very successful transaction. Two months later, 50% of our new business in Thailand comes from that acquisition. So small bolt-ons, distribution deals uh, across Asia are something we're interested in. Do you think AIA will actually get a better price than you were offering on Sunday night? I think it's something that will be closely watched. And if they don't, do you mm. rule out actually trying to go after them again at a good price? Look, we're going to do what we've always done, which is to just focus on driving the business forward, producing good, good numbers, good results quarter after quarter. Uh, that's been our, our reputation, the basis for our credibility in the market, and we'll, we'll continue doing that. Now, you say, because you've, you've paid the, one of the largest prices in terms of the volatility that we've seen on the markets. Mm. Do you think this will continue, volatility on the market? 
I think that there are some very deep imbalances uh, in the world economy, and I think that those, takes, those take a long time to, 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 to get resolved. And one of the things with this crisis is that we, we've all probably been too optimistic uh, about the length of time that it will take to, to, to absorb all those imbalances. Yeah. Mr. Tiam, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so Thank much you for joining much. us today Pleasure. here on Bloomberg.